Hi, it's Dennis Daly welcoming you to Old Time Radio on Monday, a complete Old Time Radio episode. And this time around, one of the best episodes of one of the best science fiction shows from the 1950s on NBC, Dimension X. Dimension X. On stage tonight, Dimension X. Tonight, Dimension X presents The Martian Chronicles, a dramatization of the new novel by one of our most brilliant young science fiction writers, Ray Bradbury. The Martian Chronicles. January in the year 1999. One minute it was Ohio winter with doors closed, the panes blind with frost, icicles fringing every roof, children skiing on snowy slopes. And then a long wave of warmth crossed the small town, a flooding sea of hot air. Bye, Mom, I'm going out. William McClellan, you come back here. You know you can't go out in winter without a cold. You want to catch your death of cold? But it isn't cold, it's warm outside. It's rocket summer. Rocket summer? You know, like Indian summer. The rocket lay on the launching field, blowing out pink clouds of fire and heat, cracking the icicles, melting the snow, making summer with every breath of its mighty exhausts. It seared the faces of the watching crowd and drove them back. And then they saw the red fire and heard the big sound as the silver rocket shot up toward Mars and left them behind on an ordinary Monday morning on the ordinary planet Earth. in a house of crystal pillars on the planet Mars by the edge of an empty sea. And every morning you could see Ila eating the golden fruits that grew from the crystal walls. Or her husband sitting alone in his room reading from a singing metal book over which he brushed his hand as one might play a harp. Ila and her husband were not old. Once, they had liked painting pictures with chemical fire, swimming in the canals when the wine trees filled them with green liquors and talking into the dawn together. But no more. Marriage sometimes makes people old and familiar while still young. And Ela was not happy now. This morning, she sat dreaming between the crystal pillars and wished that somehow a miracle might happen. And then suddenly... Oh. Ela. Did you fall? No. I thought I heard you cry out. Did I? I was almost asleep and had a dream. In the daytime? Hmm. You don't often do that. Strange. How very strange. I dreamed about a man. A tall man. Six feet tall. Oh, how absurd. He'd be a giant, a misshapen giant. I know. And yet, somehow he looked quite handsome. He was dressed in a strange uniform... And he came down out of the sky in a long silver craft. Out of the sky? <laughs> what nonsense. He spoke pleasantly to me in another language. But somehow I understood him with my mind. <laughs> Telepathy, I suppose. A really ill. And he said, I've come from the third planet in my ship. My name is Nathaniel York. A stupid name. Who ever heard of a name like that? Perhaps they have names like that on Earth. Well, that's ridiculous, Hila. Everyone knows the third planet is incapable of supporting life. There's too much oxygen in their atmosphere. I suppose. But haven't you ever wondered if... Well, wouldn't it be fascinating if there were people there... and they traveled through space in some sort of ship? Oh, really, Ela? You know I hate this emotional wailing. Now let's get on with our work. Evening came. The twin white moons of Mars were rising, and the house closed itself in like a giant flower. A wind blew among the pillars, stirring Ela's russet hair, crooning softly in her ear. And it was then that she began singing the song. Drink to me, only oh thine eyes, and the with mine. 
Sheila. What's that song? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? I've never heard it before. Did you compose it? No. Yes. No, I don't know, really. I don't even know what the words are. They're in another language. It was part of the dream I had, I guess. Oh. You know, you haven't been yourself lately. It might do you good if we went away to the Blue Mountains for a week or so. Uh, what? Did you hear what I said? I'm sorry. I was watching the sky. You're certainly interested in the sky tonight. It's very beautiful. Well, what about my suggestion? Shall we leave for the Blue Mountains in the morning? You mean go away now? Oh, no. No? Why not? Why don't you want to go? I don't know. I just don't want to, that's all. Oh, leave a kiss in the cup and not a school. Ela, I'm sick of that silly song. It's late. Let us sleep. From the crystal walls poured a soft carpeting of mist to support Ela where she lay down to sleep. But through the night she tossed restlessly until just at dawn the dream recurred. Ela, oh. Ela, wake up. What? Oh, what is it? You've been dreaming again. You talked in your sleep. Did I? Yes. What were you dreaming? Oh, the ship. It came from the sky again. And the tall man stepped out and talked with me. <laughs> Telling me little jokes and laughing. What else happened? And then this, this Captain York... Oh, I can't. It's all so silly. Tell me. He said I was beautiful. And then he kissed me. I thought so. What else? Why, Eel, you're so bad-tempered. It's only a dream. Is it? You know I can read your mind. You can't keep secrets from me. Well... All that happened was this Captain York told me... Well, he told me he'd take me away in his ship, into the sky. Take me back to his planet with him. <laughs> it's quite ridiculous, really. Ridiculous, is it? You should have heard yourself. Fawning on him, talking to him, singing with him all night. In your dream, he landed in Green Valley, didn't he? Please. And he told you he was coming today. Yes. But what's come over you? It was only a dream. You can't be jealous of that. No, no, I suppose not. Forgive me. I'm being childish. Eel, you're sick. You've been working too hard. No, no, I'm all right. But perhaps you're right. Maybe I could use a little relaxation. Yes. I think I'll take the morning off and go hunting. Hunting? Yes, in Green Valley. <laughs> Dumbly, she watched him go to a closet and draw forth an evil-looking weapon. And then her husband was gone, walking toward Green Valley. And Ela waited, watching the sky for an unknown thing, trembling with a nameless fear. And then it happened. A whirring, rushing sound. The warmth as of a giant fire passing in the air. The gleam of metal in the sky. He's come. It's true. The dream is true. The rocket vanished over the hill. The sky was empty again. And trembling, Ela waited again, looking toward Green Valley and seeing nothing. Listening for sounds and hearing nothing. Until... A shot sounded, very sharply, the sound of the evil weapon. Oh, no. No, no, no. Her body jerked with the sound. And she wanted to scream and never stop screaming. For now she knew the dream could never come true. There was nothing left but the song, the strange and fine and beautiful song. Drink to me only with thine eyes, and I will pledge with mine. Or leave a kiss within the cup. <laughs> <laughs> when 
But still the rockets came. The next ship came down from the stars and the black velocities and the silent gulfs of space and landed by night near a Martian city. The men made their way to the outer rim of the dreaming city and then Jeff Spender went in to reconnoiter while the others watched and waited. Waited for something to stir in the haunted city, some gray form to rise, some voice to break the unearthly stillness. Where were the people? Where were the Martians? Nothing stirred to disturb the silence until... Halt! Who goes there? Don't shoot! Hold it, Parker. Let's spend her in his party. They're coming back. Captain Wilde! Over here! Well? Captain, we've searched the city. People were living here last week. People? Martians. Where are they now? Dead. Dead? What did they die of? You won't believe it, Captain. Chicken pox. Good Lord, no. Yes. No resistance to an Earth disease, I guess. So the other rocket did get through to Mars. It looks like it, Captain. God only knows what the Martians did to them. But at least we know what they did to the Martians. You mean they're all dead? Yes. This planet is through. Hey, you hear that, guys? We're safe. <laughs> Break out a bottle, Cookie. Let's have a drink to celebrate. Stop it, Parkhill. Put down that bottle. Ah, what's eating you, Spender? The planet's ours now. We got a christener, don't we? <laughs> I christen thee the city of... Uh, I christen... Hey, Park Hill City, huh? Park Hill, I warned you! All right, Spender, that's enough. That'll cost you a $50 fine. Cookie McClure... Take care of Park Hill. Spender, you come with me. All right, Spender, why did you hit him? I don't know, Captain. I was ashamed, I guess. Ashamed of Sam Park Hill and the noise and the spectacle the whole crew was making. It's been a long trip. It's only natural they'd want to have their fling. Yes, but where's their sense of what's right? Their respect for what's happened here. Captain, a race builds itself for a million years. Refines itself, builds cities like this one. Does everything it can to give itself respect and beauty and... And then... It dies. Of what? Not anything fine or majestic or fitting, but... But a dirty little thing like chicken pox. And Sam Parkhill wants to celebrate. I know, Spender, but you've got to remember you've a different way of seeing things. I'm seeing things all right. I'm seeing what we'll do to Mars. We'll rip it up, rip the skin off, ruin it the way we've ruined our own planet. Captain, look at the city. It may be the last time you'll ever see it this way. Beautiful in the moonlight, isn't it? Yes. There's a poem by Byron that describes it. And how the Martians would feel tonight. If there were any... Any of them left. So we'll go no more a-roving so late into the night. Though the heart be still as loving and the moon be still as bright. For the sword outwears its sheath. And the soul wears out the breast. And the heart must pause to breathe... And love itself must rest. Oh, the night was made for loving and the day returns too soon. Yet we'll go no more a-roving by the light of the moon. Without a word, the earth men stood and looked at the city. The bottle lay shattered at Sam Park Hill's feet. And the sour stench of liquor filled the cool air. The men of Earth had come to Mars. The men of Earth came to Mars. They came because they were afraid or unafraid. Because they were happy or unhappy. Because they felt like pilgrims or did not feel like pilgrims. The government posters screamed, There's work for you in the sky. See more. The men shuffled forward, all kinds of men, all coming for different reasons. 
The rockets came like drums beating in the night. They came like locusts swarming and settling in blooms of rosy smoke. Mars was a distant shore, and the settlers spread upon it in waves. First the pioneers and builders, then the people of civilization. Some came because they were afraid of a coming war on Earth. Some came because they were afraid of nothing. Some came to escape from the smell of the subways and the cabbage tenements. And some came from houses like the one in Ohio. It was a good house, the house in Ohio. And for six years, the family had lived there contentedly, enjoying music and poetry and the rich, warm things of life. For the house had been built to be lived in in the year 2020. It contained all the latest automatic devices, from talking book recorders to singing clocks. As the family rose and dressed, the beds whirred electronically and made themselves. In the kitchen, the stove sighed and ejected from its warm interior eight eggs, sunny side up, twelve bacon slices, two coffees, and two glasses of milk. Seven, nine, breakfast time. Come and dine. Seven, nine. Beside the breakfast table, the facsimile machine clacked and deposited the morning paper on the table. The headlines today spoke ominously of the danger of a coming war. And the man frowned as he read the news. Today is August 4th, 2026. Insurance, gas, and at and heat bills are due. And today, remember, the family has planned a picnic. Gee, Dad, are we really going? Sure, Timmy, why not? It's raining out. It's not raining where we're going, son. Now run upstairs, pack your fishing tackle. We're going on our picnic, all right. Okay, Dad. Bill... Are you sure we ought to go? Yes. Have you seen the headlines this morning? Looks bad, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. The rocket's ready. All we have to do is pack and take off. I know, but... Well, flying to Mars, it seems so crazy. Well, all right, then we'll go. Should we tell the children why we're going? No, not yet. Let them enjoy the picnic. <coughs> The house went on with its appointed tasks. 9.15, time to clean. 9.15, time to clean. Out of the molding darted hundreds of tiny mechanical mice, all rubber and metal. They sucked up the dust and dirt in the house and popped back into their burrows. In the walls, relays clicked. Memory tapes glided under electric eyes. Recorded voices moved under steel needles. 12 o'clock, 2 o'clock. Evening came. In the living room, the hearth fire bloomed out of nothing, and the phonograph spoke from beside the fireplace. Mrs. McClellan, what poem would you like to hear this evening? Mr. McClellan, since you express no preference, I shall select at random from among your favorites. Sarah Teasdale, There Will Come Soft Rains. There will come soft rains and the smell of the ground, and swallows circling with their shimmering sound. And frogs in the pool singing at night. And wild plum trees in tremulous white. Robins will wear their feathery fire, whistling their whims on a low fence wire. And not one will know of war. Not one will care at last when it is done. Not one would mind, neither bird nor tree, if mankind perished utterly. And spring herself when she woke at dawn would scarcely know that we were gone. The phonograph finished the poem, but there was no one there to hear, for the family had gone to Mars. On the Martian desert beside the highway, there rose a blare of red and yellow neon lights that spelled the death of Jeff Spender's dream. Sam's hot dog stand is what the sign read. And Sam, of course, was the same Sam Parkhill who had fought with Spender years before. 10,000 rockets were reported leaving soon for Mars with 100,000 hungry customers. And Sam wanted to be ready for them. Hey, look up there, Emma. Hmm? 
See that green star up there? That's Earth. Ah, good old wonderful Earth. <laughs> Makes you feel almost reverent, don't it? Yeah. Send me your hungry and your starved. Uh, something, something. That's a poem I learned in school. <laughs> Come on, Earth, send me your rockets. Here's Sam Parker with the only hot dog stand on Mars. Sam, what if the rockets don't come? What if there's a war on Earth? Ah, don't worry, they're coming all right. Ain't nothing gonna happen to spoil my plans, baby. I figured it all out. Sam! Hey, Sam, look up there! Earth! Well, what? Oh, no! It's catching fire! It's burning! Oh, no, that can't be Earth! Helma, they can't do this to me. I got all our money invested <laughs> in this place. I... Go ahead, Sam. Switch on more lights. Turn up the music. Get the hot dogs on the fire. There'll be another batch of customers coming along in about a hundred million years. Oh, no, it couldn't be. What a swell spot for our hot dog stand. Let you in on a little secret, Sam. This looks like it's going to be an off season. Team Radio crackled with the news. By morning, the shelves of the luggage store were empty, and the rockets were blasting off, headed back to Earth. In a few days, everyone was gone, and the planet of Mars once more lay deserted and silent. And then, after all the rest had gone, one last rocket landed on Mars. A small, family-sized rocket come all the way from Earth. It seemed a long way to go for a picnic, but Dad had suggested a fishing trip, and Mother thought the whole family would enjoy a vacation. So here they were, floating down a Martian canal, with Timothy sitting in the back of the boat with Dad and Mother up front holding Alice the baby and the deserted Martian towns drifting slowly by. Dad. What is it, Timmy? When do we see the Martians? You promised we would. Soon, Tim, soon. Oh, but William, the last Martians died out years ago. They're a dead race now. Not quite. Don't worry, son. I'll show you some real live Martians later on. Gee, this is swell. I wish we didn't ever have to go home. How long can we stay? A million years. A million years? Yes. It's time we told you, son, we're not going home. This is where we'll live from now on. But what about the rocket? What about Ohio? There's nothing there now but ruins. The last Earth radio just went off the air. That means the war is over and Earth is finished. We're going to blow up our rocket and start all over. See if we can't build a better world up here. You mean Mars is going to be our home? Yes. I hope you don't mind too much. No, sir. But what about the Martians? When do we get to see them? There they are, son. Look down at the water. I don't see anything there. Beside the boat. Look at the reflections in the water. But, but that's us down there. Just you and me and Mom and the baby. Yes, son. You see, we're the Martians now. For a long, silent moment, Timmy stared down at the reflections of the family in the waters. And the Martian stared back up at him. And then he lifted his eyes to the deep ocean sky, trying once more to see Earth and the house he had always called home. But Earth was too far away, and the house was now only a heap of radioactive rubble. Only one wall remained standing, and within the wall a voice spoke again and again and again. Not one would mind, neither bird nor tree, if mankind perished utterly, and spring herself, when she woke at dawn, would scarcely know that we were gone, 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 that we were gone. Today is October 5th, 2026.
You have just heard The Martian Chronicles, a dramatization of highlights from the new novel by Ray Bradbury. The world of... Dimension X. The preceding was transcribed on NBC. Join me every Monday at this time for a new, complete, old-time radio episode from the archives of old-time radio. 